Laura felt she was finally ready to get back into the dating scene after hard work and therapy strengthened her sense of self. Her family provided her with heartfelt encouragement to get back in the game. She mostly swiped left, but every once in a quickening heartbeat, she swiped right. One of those fateful swipes positively responded, and a date and time were set. The evening was going better than she had expected, and even though she could hear her wise therapist in her ear saying, do not go back to anyone's house on the first date, this guy seemed different. Great condo, great neighborhood, great conversation, better ass. What could go wrong? The first red flag was that he lived alone with a cat. Don't single dudes have dogs? She checked her judgy emotional mind and accepted the beer as he sat down on the opposite side of the sofa. See, what a gentleman. As Laura sat sipping her beer, that same cat she spied as she walked through the door hopped up into the attractive owner's lap and he began to pet it. His face became somber and he spoke with a heightened sense of melancholy. You have a dog, don't you? She nodded. Don't you think it is so hard to be both the mother and the father to your pet sometimes? He then began to lick his cat's face, cleaning it as a mother cat would. Oh God, thought Laura, how in the hell do I get out of here? From our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, this is the Psych Bites Podcast. The Psych Bites Podcast is where mental health professionals offer practical psychology to enhance your life. I'm Dr. Craig Pullman, neurodevelopmental psychologist. I'm Jennifer Feintz, licensed professional counselor. In this episode, we're talking about dating and the search for love. In the opening, you heard just part of the true story of Laura. After we discuss the history of dating, challenges people are facing in today's dating scene, and tips for finding the right person, we'll share more of Laura's story. Be sure to stick around because I promise it's worth it. Now, we, we, should, we should disclose here that Laura is based on a client of yours. Yes, right, she is a true human. And names have been changed to protect, protect the, the innocent. innocent. And, yes. and she also, she, you asked and she gave permission to share she, her story. Yes, she is a lot of things and one of them is having a great sense of humor. So she loved the idea of somebody else learning from her experience. That, that's awesome. So um, how much of your therapy practice would you say address, helps people address the issue of dating and, and the search for love? I wouldn't say it's a primary aspect of my focus, but it's such an interweave in people's lives because so many of us are constantly examining our relationships. And, and that's a lot of times what will drive people to seek their own therapy is there's some aspect of their relationships, either intimate relationships or work relationships or school relationships that aren't working quite well for them. So the topic of how do I manage my relationships? What What's a good one? What's not a good one? What should I be looking for? What I not be looking for? That's a huge piece of what I do all the time. Now, now when, uh, how long is your career? Like, when did you start as a therapist? I have been an individual and family therapist for going on almost 19 years. Okay, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost at the two decade mark. I know. <laughs> so, um, but Boy, a lot of changes in 19 years just in, in dating in the world. Well, this is one of the funny things. And, and I feel like, you know, nobody wants to be in therapy with a robot. So I am willing to share. I think some might. <laughs> well, yeah, depending on and what we could can, be heading that direction. Depending on what we can program them to say back to us. But I think I'm really honest of saying that if I had found my spouse or was looking for my spouse today, it would be an entirely different story. And I think... Oh, I never thought of that. Right? Like, wow. how grateful... And I say this. I am so grateful that when I was dating and when I met my husband, that it was what I would consider to be a very organic process, that, that there was no technology involved in yeah. ever meeting my spouse, right? And that it is unbelievably hard. And, and it brings a totally different dynamic. I, yeah, it was really organic for me, too. So how long have you been married to Chad? Uh, it'll be 15 years this year. Okay. Um, Jen and I— How about I, you and Jen? Uh, it'll be 19 years. Congratulations. In, in, uh, in April. Nice. Yeah, it, we got married in 2000, so it's very easy for me to calculate. I was going to say, you got lucky. Yeah. I have to do math. So, um, yeah, well, what I, I mean, what kind of struck you about your dating experience with Chad? Well, the like funny thing, what, what well, yeah, I mean, the funny thing, so here we go, ready? We met at church. 
Oh, cue, cue yes, either eye right, roll right. or cue like more buzzies. He needs like some chorus music. I know, right? Maybe the Sean angels saying no, but I think what was really funny is that we and and it sounds super canned, and you say it all the time, but we started out as friends. We were really, really good friends. Um, but I liked him practically from the moment I met him. I call him Mr. Blue Eyes, and like I wanted him to ask me out so bad, and he was oblivious to the fact that I had any interest in him. And I feel like I all but like threw myself. Was he at was him. he <laughs> To finally get him, was, and he was like, "You was didn't he, like me," and I'm like, "I was he all really, but like held was he really fine. oblivious, or was he just shy?" Or? No, he genuinely felt like we had this great friendship, and that I just didn't have an interest in him, and I was very geared towards my professional career, and was always doing and traveling, and he thought, "Well, she's not," you know. I mean, he sort of thought, you know, this chick is never going to want to date me. So, okay, so what was your first date? Um, we went to dinner at a great restaurant. I was living in D.C. at that point. Well, he was <laughs> he was also living in D.C. But we met in Old Town Alexandria, which is a great if anybody knows, it's like right on the right. Potomac River. Great restaurants, great bars. But the funny thing is, is I was I was wearing a skirt. This is part of the story. And there's this great metal staircase that goes up to where like from the bar to where you have a restaurant and I tripped <laughs> and <laughs> fell like hard and I'm going to go out on a limb and say he he got a peek at something that perhaps would not normally show up at the first uh-huh. date but I did stand up and went ta da cuz like what else can you do right you leaned in I did I oh I hate All right so, so I have to How share about you and Jen? I have to share this so um and and, and I got permission <laughs> from my wife to share this so um I, I was, I had just started my postdoc fellowship at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And, uh, oh, come on. <laughs> Carolina rocks. <sighs> uh, so, um, yeah, so I, I was uh, in, in the building where my office was. Just down the hall was this big conference room where my supervisor was teaching a class, an evening class in neuropsych. And so I would just go in there and I would informally audit the class and I would sit at one end of this room. And, and the students would, would gather around this big conference table and sometimes uh, on the walls, too. And I was in there a couple of times when suddenly I looked up and at the far end of the table, sitting at the head of the table, was Jen. And I'm not kidding. I looked at her and it was like she was glowing. Oh, schnarf. And, and, and I just couldn't take my eyes mm. off her. That sounds really kind of like stalkerish. No. And, and after that, I started to see her everywhere. So was she following you or were you following her? No, honestly, she just was, our paths kept crossing. Not that we talked or anything, but I just, I saw her on her bike and I saw her, she worked out, uh, she was a a checkout, a cashier at at this grocery store and I was here at the gym and that's where we had our first conversation. We literally you bumped into each other. You picked up a girl at the gym. You're at, that guy, Craig. At, well, it gets worse. At <laughs> the 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 uh, the drinking fountain, and then so we had our first little conversation, and then the next time we were at the gym, she was on the stairmaster, so I had her trapped. Oh, and so geez. that's when I that's when I asked her out, and so our first date was a hike. Which is a great first date. That's a great date. first date cause because you're doing something yes. and it gives you stuff to talk yes. about and there's and it's a memory. Yes. Love it. And there's exercise to relieve well the tension. Done. And you don't have this is really important I noticed. You don't have to maintain eye contact. Right on. You know, so so that was that was really awesome. So um, we alluded to kind of the, the changes in dating over time. I think it'd be wouldn't it be interesting if we sort of went through the history I actually think it would be okay. super interesting. And as we sort of did this for ourselves, I learned so much just in for sure reading something, like stuff that I was like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. Because I think a lot of times people have a preconceived idea of how easy it used to be. Mm-hmm. Like it was so easy in the old right. day, like in the olden days. Here's my the air days quotes. of your right. Or lore and it's or like, oh, gosh, what we learned about a lot of this. Okay, so so we should acknowledge uh, one of our sources for this information is a book called Labor of Love by Maura, uh, Maura Weigel. Hope I'm saying that right. Weigel. Weigel. Okay, and yes. then we also really targeted a timeline from Huffington Post that had done, um, you know, an article on same subject. So before this thing that we know of as dating... Marriages were arranged really for economics, for stability, mm. for uh, for political alliances. That's so like today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
in not. some circles. Um, <laughs> yeah, to get land. To so not to get laid, wealth. but to get land. Well, maybe that was in there somewhere. So right, okay, just checking. Status, but 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 really, but not love. That right. was not what marriages were about. And it was not what people were looking for. So weddings were actually seen as business arrangement between families. They weren't emotionally driven. This wasn't like, oh, I'm so connected to you. This was, we're gonna we're gonna sign on the dotted line almost like a contract. It, they were mergers, hostile or or, or otherwise, <laughs> or, depending on. So here, here's a, a sort of an initial date. In 1695, Jesus. <laughs> personal ads were used to help British bachelors find wives. And ads would include details like the bachelor's age and the extent of his wealth. So I love that, like, money has always been a thing. So let's just mm-hmm. be really honest that as women, going all the way back, like, wow, what's the math? 400 years ago? Money mattered. It is what it is. It is what it, it is. It was what it was. But this is my favorite. 1727, Englishwoman Helen Morrison became the first woman to place an ad right on Helen, the Lonely Hearts column. It was said she was seeking someone nice to spend her life Aww. with. So, I mean, this whole idea of like, I'm, I'm, I'm right, like, I want a nice guy mm-hmm. goes back a long way. But interestingly, nice guys didn't always exist. The mayor had her committed. To an insane asylum. But only for four weeks. <laughs> then Still she does was, not make it okay. Then she was released on her own recognizance. It was so crazy to look for a man. Yeah. So um, <laughs> so then in the mid-1800s, magazines and periodicals really grew in popularity, and so did personal ads. That's where they showed up. That's where people found them. And increasingly number, increasing numbers of people were finding relationships this way. So then... By the end of that century, scam artists. So again, this whole idea of phishing, it's been around yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Scam artists use these ads to their advantage. Phishing and fake profiles were ways scammers could prey on vulnerable people. Now, I don't think they used the term phishing no. back then. No. But the concept. Well, and I think it goes to show that the minute that this idea that People put themselves in vulnerable positions, and people immediately decided they could go ahead and take advantage. Right, right. Yep. So the old is new, and the new is old. Mm-hmm. The term dating was coined in 1896, and it, it appeared in a column in the Manchester Weekly Journal. A young man was lamenting in this column that his girlfriend was seeing other men, that they were filling all my dates on her calendar. So hence, dating. Which I think is funny. Can we just like pause that Manchester, as in like Manchester United, Man City, right? Who stank? It's it's the center of the to, universe in so I have many to ways. Go, no, it's really not. They're awful. This is a thing between Craig and I. Anytime Manchester comes up, yep. I'm gonna bust him. That and the Red Sox and the Yankees. We'll oh, come back to that perhaps later. Dating could actually be a felony in the 1900s. I found this not, so interesting. Not a misdemeanor. <laughs> Not a misdemeanor. This was a felony, people, because it was considered that if a young man was meeting a woman in public, buying her food, drinks, gifts, that this was the same thing as prostitution in the eyes of the police. So uh, in the 1920s, personal ads went mainstream again, along with calls for pen pals. And pen pals were popular among lonely soldiers during World War One. 1965. So now we've moved into the the height of what would we call what would we call the 60s? The, the Affectionately, 60s? the swinging 60s. The, we're almost to the summer of love there in 67. Yeah. So Harvard undergrads created Operation Match, and this was actually the world's first computer dating service. Leave it to Harvard for three bucks. Users could answer questionnaires and receive a list of potential matches. That's a bargain. I right. Three bucks. What does what? it cost to do any of these? Da- I mean, do these dating apps cost these days? Actually, I mean, I, it was right. funny as well, I was so thinking about this. I'm like, I don't think you have to pay. Some of the, well, so you might pay like 99 cents for an app for the for a uh, for like one of the dating ones, really? For, yeah, for a, a what do I, uh, an ad free app? That's what I mean. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but still, in, in inflation adjusted dollars. All right, there you go. So um, in the 1990s and the 2000s, before the web had specified or dedicated d- dating sites. People started using technology to meet others with similar interests through things like online bulletin boards. Do you remember those? I do. Online bulletin boards? Well, but the. Like an antique. Right. Never um, did it myself. Yeah. So new, that was. News groups, messaging, 
Um, and also, you know, email, too, was another way that people were, were well, connecting. We actually, because of, of where we live in the Colonial Yards, we emailed. That was one of the huge ways that we communicated because we couldn't always talk by phone. And, and I think it's so funny now. It's like the modern day version of letter writing. Mm-hmm. Like I have yeah. all of my grandfather's love letters to my grandmother and we have emails. I was like, is that like, is that sad or is it? No. Is that kind of cute? No, yeah. In the 2000s, the Facebook relationship status was included. And I love the one that's like air quotes. It's complicated. Right. That was big. What does that I, even mean? What, that's the whole point. It could mean anything. It's it's that ambiguity. You know, See, I would avoid that with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. So it, it, from the 2010 and, and on to today, uh, there are dating sites for cities and sexual orientations and religions and races and almost every hobby. You know, there, there's a, like Christian Mingle and there's, there's some app or website for farmers. <laughs> Farmersonly.com. Far, far, there you go. So now it's easier to find what you're looking for, yet it's harder to stumble on someone who exists outside our predefined identity bubbles. You know, we had a summer intern this last summer at the Ballantine office. So here's our plug for for the summer intern program. But we had an intern, Maddie, who did this phenomenal research, particularly into this subject. And she actually said that there's two new dating apps that are getting ready to come out that are trying to do a better job of even really drilling down to get away from some of that fishing and other things and that require you to answer three different sort of really cool open-ended questions about yourself and what was the i can't remember what the other one was but i feel like they're even really trying to take it to the next level to really narrow down and really help you to find that that right soulmate absolutely so really kind of recap you know dating's a relatively new thing um and because finding love wasn't such a big deal in days and years and centuries past no and and again moving from the the economic approach to it being more relational and it and it really took a while to catch on because of the whole idea of women's role in society and their rights i mean for a long time if a guy was going to take a girl out on a date she was going to be labeled a prostitute Mm -hmm. so i mean let's just let's put those two things together right let's just call it what it is so in a little bit we'll we'll get into some of the um some of the challenges that people are facing with this new landscape of dating and offer some offer some tricks for survival Survival's Guide. Is dating dead? That's the popular question about hookup culture and the technology-driven world of meeting romantic partners. This is Elise Howell, licensed professional counselor. She has insights to share from her therapy work with clients navigating the dating landscape. Young adults are taking their time to commit to long-term relationships, which is a phenomenon characteristic of the new developmental period of emerging adulthood, where young people are delaying careers and marriage. This extended period allows for individuals to explore relationships without the pressure to commit to a long-term relationship. The intentional planning of serious dates has been exchanged for ambiguous, casual encounters, also known as a hookup. A hookup is defined as an uncommitted sexual encounter, Hookup culture is the perception that everyone is having fun hooking up, and you should be too. Whether someone calls it a hookup or casual sex, there are unspoken norms about how to behave with a strong emphasis on the noncommittal aspect of the hookup. It's cool not to care. Individuals may avoid caring actions such as hand-holding and texting back. Some avoid hooking up with people they actually like. Communication is rarely face-to-face, and a direct sharing of emotions and relational needs is rare. Based on the current research on love and attachment, the behaviors of a casual hookup run counter to the biological processes that create a loving bond with another person. The very strategies used to avoid connection are ones needed to create a connection. Young adults have communicated differing opinions about the new normal. Some love it, some hate it, and some just want to get a text back. Some young adults eventually burn out from casual sex, often feeling cynical and lonely. In my next bite, we'll talk about some strategies for connecting successfully with a partner in the world of hooking up. For more information on dating and relationship advice, check out psychbites.com.
Craig, you and I have actually spent a lot of time digging into some of this and even having some real back and forth conversation about what we're really beginning to see within the clients that we see and the shifts and changes in society. And I think in the work that I do, I've really seen two themes, for lack of a better phrase, of some of the clinical work that have emerged out of this that I find myself doing the most in session. And that's Mm -hmm. around this idea of internal versus external locus of control, which I'll sort of explain in a second. And then watching individuals sacrifice their values, like sacrifice fundamental pieces of who they are just Mm -hmm. to try to find you know, their soulmate or love or whatever that would be, because it is so important. We're fundamentally wired for connection. We are wired to be in community with other people. And so I think there's this drive to really find that person. And then I think there's so much attached to this idea of either being single or not single. So I said earlier, like internal versus external locus of control. So it's the idea that if I have an internal locus of control, I feel like I'm in control of my choices, my thoughts, my feelings, the steps that I take. Generally, external locus of control, we feel like somebody is being externally driven. All the things are coming at them. Their choices are determined by other people. And so I watch people begin to feel like who's maybe choosing them or what society is saying about them determines the decisions that they then make. Like if this person likes me on this dating app, then that must mean I am likable. Or or the idea that depending on wanting to be successful at this then determines the choices that I make. So really that these dating apps have begun to determine and sort of dictate people's choices for them as opposed to feeling like, no, I'm in control of who I am and how I'm thinking about myself or other people. Would would another way to phrase this is that uh, people are seeking validation and affirmation from other sources as opposed to finding that within themselves. A hundred percent. So the number of likes I get on a post or whatever, or mm-hmm. swipes, whatever, that's that's mm-hmm. an indication of my value as a person. Mm-hmm. And I've watched individuals come into my office who maybe this wasn't an area of struggle for them. Like maybe like this whole idea of external locus, you know, locus control or finding validation wasn't. But as they ventured more into this scene, like I've seen that shift in them. That they used to be somewhat, you know, confident people, knew who they were, knew what mattered to them. And all of a sudden they weren't finding success or what they would determine success as in like a lasting relationship. And so they started to think there was something wrong with them. Mm. And and it and it really, you know, it's so interesting to me because again, I I didn't date during the time of dating app. So the idea of an app determining my self-worth or whether or not somebody swiped left or right determining whether or not I was attractive or worth getting to know, no. In in, in our third segment, we're going to talk about how you help people with that in this modern age. So I'm really looking forward to that. So, So what about values? Well, I think what's interesting is that you can have maybe a value about, you know, the things that we, that, or that we would talk about as values, right? Like the types of people you hang out with, maybe the types of things that you get involved with, how you spend your money, where you give your time. And I think sometimes what I see is, is as people become more and more desperate mm. to find, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Right, whatever it would be, they begin to sacrifice some of those things. And it's usually a slow progression. It's not like, oh, I abandon everything all at once. But, maybe, you know, but they say, well, this used to be important to me, but I can't find anybody who agrees with me. So maybe it's just me, right? Maybe I'm just being inflexible or maybe I'm not being open minded enough. So I'll go ahead and sit this to the side. But then that's a really slippery slope. Then right. It that you began to shift what's always been important to you to fit um, a mold or a type of person. I mean that that begins a real downhill slide. And you know, do, do you see that? Do, do you see that sort of giving up of your values, both in sort of a general sense? Like I, I think it's it would make me seem more cool if I become a vegetarian or something. Mm-hmm. I'm, then I'm going to attract somebody. And do you also see it within a specific relationship, like? I think I really like this person I'm dating. And I think, you know, if I act more conservative with my values and take on those, then then maybe he'll ask me to marry him. Oh, 100 percent. So both of those. Oh, 100 yeah. percent. And sometimes both at the same time. And I think what's interesting is that we, you know, we as human beings, we can delude ourselves pretty easily and we can justify a lot of things mm-hmm. a lot of the times. And I think it's interesting the when I sometimes we tell ourselves. Right. And I think it's really interesting sometimes when I, you know, you just rephrase it differently. Right. So somebody comes in my office and they say, well, 
you know, this really matters to him or that really mattered to her. And so I realized that, you know, maybe I was really just, you know, me, I wasn't, you know, thinking about it clearly or hadn't thought about that perspective. Okay, good, right? The ability to be flexible or perspective taking is good. But then when I turn around and phrase it to him and go, well, I always knew that was really important to you. Do you feel like you've just sacrificed a piece of yourself to make that person happy? I usually get like an eyebrow raise, like, like wow, fights. You know, that was a little harsh, but it's it's a different way to look at it. Yes, flexibility is good. Yes, being open minded is good. Yes, being willing to think about something differently is a good thing. But if the next thing I know, this thing has always been really important to me and it has guided the way I live my life for however many years and in a date or in a few dates, I flip on that. It's a little bit of a red flag to me. All right, so we, we've alluded several times to the, the current dating landscape being driven a lot by new technology and apps and websites. And, you know, when it comes to dating, we're kind of out of the scene. So <laughs> we old let's, and let's out just of the see loop. how much we really know or don't know. And so let's bring in our colleague, Mara Teal. Hello, Mara. Hey, how's it going? Mara, Yay, Mara. is a uh, licensed professional counselor. And she is our quiz master. Pretty excited about it. That so, should come uh, with some theme music, in my opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, yeah, what do, you, what do you have for us? Okay, get ready, guys. Um, I'm scared. Born ready. I'm, I'm legit <laughs> scared. You should, you should be a little bit. I should be a little bit. <laughs> I'm, just, okay. I'm like, oh, gosh. Uh, okay, here's a softball for you. Oh, no. Okay. okay. What is the difference between dating someone exclusively and calling each other boyfriend, girlfriend? Now, how, how, so... Who goes first here? Am I going? Ladies I, first, Craig. Okay. Come on now. Are, Aren't you right. a Southern every gentleman? Every time? Every time? I, I got to. Oh, Mr. Competitive, you get to go first. Actually, I should let you go first because in my head, that like, isn't it? Isn't that the same thing? I mean, if we want to get into the gender politics that like, are we saying that you can also say girlfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, so that's it's not, not part of that. The question. Okay. Right. Isn't it the same thing? I, I, I'm literally asking what is the difference? Oh, what is? So <sighs> no. Why you gotta be so specific? <laughs> um, the difference is I'm only seeing you, but I am not yet your girlfriend. I'm willing to agree to not see other humans, but you're not allowed to own me yet as your girlfriend. Okay. okay. I okay. need to hear the question again. Okay. <laughs> you cheat. That was a really long answer. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> okay. What is the difference between dating someone exclusively and calling each other boyfriend, girlfriend? Um... I'm gonna say that calling each other boyfriend girlfriend is a, 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 a like a a further stage of a relationship. It's more serious than dating each other exclusively. Didn't I just say the same thing? Well, no, 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 you did not. Okay. Craig, five million points. I got five million. Oh, yes. yes, that is crap. You're right. correct. That is All right. crap. Yeah. Yeah. Lead. It's a it's more of a public commitment. Uh, with the title. I also, I, do I get an extra million because my answer was a lot shorter? Yes. That, may, that was the longest I'm answer I've I'm giving you today. the one Six. finger salute, you just can't see All it. Right. Okay. All right, next question. What is Gatsbying in the dating world? I go first this time, right? Go for what it. What is Gatsbying mm -hmm. in the dating world? Uh, I'm going to say that's, uh, that's, when you have, I'm going to go back to my Fitzgerald here. That's when you've got a lot of really superficial uh, relationships, a lot, of, a lot of superficial friends, relationships, whatever. Okay. Your player. Okay. I'm going to say it's when you show that you've got a lot of stuff, but it's not actually like true. That you're like super flashy and show all the stuff, but you don't genuinely have. So we'll give fights like 0.5. Because you're kind of sort of there. Okay, so this is when... You're on the board. Yeah. This is when you have a crush. You want them to notice you. You want them to like you. Mm. And so you kind of put your feelers out there. So like in Gatsby, he threw these big elaborate parties, parties. to get Daisy to oh. see him, get notice, his, him. notice him, come to his house, like him. So the way we do that today is... I'm going to post this on Instagram and just see, like, is this person going to comment on it? Are they going to, what are they going to say on my Snapchat story? Okay. So, mm -hmm. so right. okay. That kind of. Like, now that makes sense. Yeah. And I, can I just say that I'm heartened that young people are using I know, classic not, literature <laughs> yeah. for their lingo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There well, we go. Like, okay. 
do I'm they still even in the really lead. know who Gatsby is? I would just want to point out, yes. I'm still winning. By yes. 4,955,000, like, yeah. Right. yeah. Give or take. Cool. Something. Okay, good. All right. If someone is cushioning in their dating life, what are they doing? If someone is cushioning in their dating life, I'm saying they're keeping people in the wings. Like, okay. they're saying that they're either exclusively your boyfriend, girlfriend, but they got people, like, waiting just in case. Okay. It doesn't go well. Okay. I th- I'm going to say cushioning is a the kind of the, the current equivalent of, um, like, uh, keeping someone at a, at a safe distance. Like, you, you're, you're um, keeping them in your orbit, but you're not allowing mm-hmm. them to get really close to you. Like a Heisman. Mm-hmm. Stiff arm. Okay. Okay. Fights. We're going to give you $10 because that is exactly the right answer. Yes! Wow. You're dating someone exclusively, but you got a few people on the oh, side to soften the blow worries. just in case it falls apart. Oh, c- oh cushions yeah. around. Cushions. Thank like you very pillow. much. Yep. Thank you. Like a Thank pillow. you. Okay. Okay. Epic comeback starts right now. Yep. <laughs> Wait for it. Okay, so question four. You already used the word in your last answer, so that was a good setup. What is orbiting, or is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is orbiting a good thing or a bad thing? Yes. For, for which person? <laughs> the person who right. is orbiting? A little bit of a, yeah. So okay. we already know what orbiting is because you say it was well, his basic last answer. I'm That's saying a... he used it in his answer. I'm oh. not saying it's the same oh, sucky, sucky. Well, okay. if uh, orbiting is when someone is kind of like uh, hanging around or, or, or making trying to make an impression on someone, um, kind of staying connected, and is it good? I would say that it's not good for the orbiter. No, it's it's not good for the orbited, but it's good for the <laughs> orbiter. I okay. knew you were going to. Okay. Go. Thank you, neuropsychologist. Right. Um, I would say that orbiting is sort you know basically what Craig said, but it's the idea that you're sort of in moving in the same circles as this person. You guys know each other and you know of each other and probably know that the other one is interested in them, but you're not. You know, you haven't gone on a date yet. That's a better answer. Um, <laughs> but that I would say good thing or bad thing. I mean, I, I see this as almost like a philosophical answer, right? Like, I would much rather you get to know a person. So I'm going to say yes, orbiting is good. So we're going to give Craig 10 points. Ten, ten, ten points. Ten. 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 We're going to give I got .5. Relax. We're going to give you like 20.1. Okay. So... Here's the answer. So orbiting is when a person cuts off all direct, meaningful communication with someone, but they orbit by just following them on social media, kind of talking to them through through those means. But we're not really going deep. We're not going meaningful. So if you want, right? So if you want a real relationship, orbiting is not good. Not good. Oh. So glad I'm final. almost 20 years married. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm like, <laughs> this is so stressful. <laughs> okay, final. Final question. Um, what is a zombie in dating? <laughs> oh, so in this dating. is not like what I, I, was, I was like, oh, I got this. I was this. on that. Yeah. yeah, no. In dating. Oh, my first? Yes, you are. Oh, Lord. <laughs> my initial thought is not podcast appropriate. Um, <laughs> a zombie is... Wow, because I just keep coming up like it's not being ghosted. I have no idea, and I'm even trying to contextually come up with what a zombie in dating would be. Somebody that has decided to say they're never going to date again, like they are, I'm never dating again. So I'm stretching here. That's what I'm going with. Someone who needs Viagra or who has had too much <laughs> and is in need to seek medical attention for an <laughs> erection lasting more than eight hours. Well, like, okay. okay. That's got to be it, right? No. Craig, like, you know. Three points for creativity. That's Thank good. you. Okay. You at least got some creativity points. I got nothing. No, you know what? You use ghosted, which uh, is another was, really yeah. great term. So we'll give you 23.95 It's Thank points. you. You're mm-hmm. welcome. I appreciate that. That okay. makes Wait. up for that point five that I got a minute ago, by yes. the way. Wait, so what is it? What? Okay, so this is the attempt to come back into your ex's life after oh. you have successfully ghosted. Oh, so yes. you have I you have not engaged in any kind of communication. You disappeared, and, you and now you're them. trying to come back. You've come uh, back from yes. whatever with like a quick little hey text. I love that I now have a term for this because this happens all the time to mm-hmm. people who've been really hurt. Mm-hmm. I love I have a term for this now. zombie. Y- your therapy skills have been high. I was gonna say Mara has well, just made me better at my job. So we've learned <laughs> that that literature has inspired yes. some terminology, mm-hmm. as have. 
AMC. Uh, the horror, yeah, the ho- <laughs> horror gen- genre. An entire generation of humans. Yeah. Well, thank well you, Maura. So, so who who is the winner of the quiz today? Um, points wise, do, I mean, do, do, I think do, Craig, do, 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 do. but no, accuracy. I got ten million points. Oh, I did. Take my points from me, sister. Yeah. Our producer and engineer over there, they've been keeping score, and they're signaling that fights is the winner. Well played, fights, and thank you, Mara. That was awesome. No problem. What seems to be most common in hookup culture is that individuals enjoy the freedom of hooking up for a time, but can find it overwhelming to bridge the gap into a long-term relationship. Long-term relationships come with a different set of patterns of behavior necessary for cultivating and sustaining love. Avoidance and indirect expression characteristic of hookup culture prevent emotional attunement, an essential ingredient of a successful, committed relationship. Partners in committed relationships are seeking assurance that their partner is available, emotionally responsive, and dependable. Verbal and nonverbal responses that are direct, honest, and caring are the foundation for love and trust. This requires individuals to take a higher risk compared to the low risk of a hookup. They need to express their feelings in hopes of establishing a stronger connection in a relationship. Here are some strategies for finding and creating real connections. First off, we need to be aware of the cultural pressure to disconnect. Culture has a powerful influence on our behavior. For example, consider whether or not the urge to text back is based on what you want versus what you feel you should do to play it cool. We also want to explore our willingness to be vulnerable, take emotional risks, and engage in the discomfort of potential rejection. If discomfort or fear of vulnerability are barriers to the life you want, consider talking with a counselor. When you start to talk with someone or get involved in a relationship, communicate how you feel and ask for what you want. It's normal and okay to have needs in a relationship, and it's okay to express how you feel. Seek out people who respect your emotional needs rather than reject them. And in our relationships, we also want to practice kindness and authenticity, even if it's casual. You may not be ready to commit, but you can engage in caring behaviors that create a foundation for future interactions. For example, if you want to text someone, text them back rather than waiting a certain amount of time so you don't lose an emotional game of chicken. Or if you want to see somebody, let them know. And we can do this without seeming overeager. Think about what kind of partner you want to be and start practicing that now. And lastly, rather than avoid people you like, hang out with them. When you're putting yourself out there, showing people how you feel, and connecting with people you like, it's more likely that you'll be able to start a relationship that's fulfilling. Well, that's it for me. My name is Elise Howell, and I'm a contributor at PsychBytes. For more information on practical psychology to enhance your life, visit psychbytes.com. Fights, let's talk solutions and tips and tricks and ways that people can better navigate this kind of scary landscape mm-hmm. out there that is mm-hmm. dating. So what, are some, what are some thoughts? Well, I had said earlier this idea of knowing these things about you pretty much like your whole life, right? Knowing what you like, what you don't like, what's important to you, what's not, and having that shift. And I would say, please don't abandon ship halfway Mm -hmm. through the dating experience just to be with a specific human. And if you find yourself continuously sacrificing things or changing things about yourself and you're either not seeing that in the other person or it's not something that you've ever done before, I would I would encourage you to take a step back and examine that. Why are you doing this? Is this genuine growth or is it sacrifice? Is it abandoning your values? How do you help clients with that? What are some of the techniques you used to get them to have that paradigm shift? I think it's being willing to, um, well, I ask a lot of open-ended questions of them, right. just trying to get them to think through it. So doing it for themselves. And I'm a big believer of putting pen to paper um, and the idea of almost like a, a pros and cons list, but really trying to put things down. What is it that I genuinely like about this person? What do I genuinely like about myself? And that can be really hard for people. What What is good about me? Why should somebody be excited to say, you know, 
Craig's my boyfriend or fights is my girlfriend, right? So what is it that's good about me? What am I bringing to the table? And what am I maybe, what's maybe not so great? And what I am sacrificing and no relationship is perfect. You are not ever going to find the perfect human. You're not ever going to be the perfect human. No relationship is going to be without troubles or flaws. But, but there are certain things that aren't as healthy. And if you've got a real sort of either framework for yourself or putting some of this down on paper. And I think the other thing is having open-ended conversation. Like if you have found yourself doing something that you don't necessarily like about yourself or you're sort of questioning about and you engage in a conversation with, with your partner or the person that you're in this relationship with, I would say, you know, what is their response? How do you think it would go if you talked to somebody about that? Do you think they'd go, oh, gosh, I didn't realize I was making you feel that way or I didn't realize this was important to you and they're open to it and willing to talk to you about it and are maybe willing to encourage you to, to go, I don't know, go back. Great. That sounds like a good thing to me. If you, if I were to say to you, so what do you happens if you brought this up with this person and your instinct would be like, oh my gosh, they'd get so mad at me or they'd probably dump me or whatever it be, then yeah, maybe that's a pretty good answer so, to whether or not you should continue. So so um, answering open-ended questions is really useful, whether it be in conversation or through journaling mm -hmm. and just spending some time and getting your thoughts out there and, and coming to some different conclusions about yourself mm -hmm. and your life and your values. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are some other, other thoughts about how people can survive? Well, survive I, I the, love... Dating wild? Um, I love the idea of bringing other people into the mix. So like I always sort of encourage, like, why does the very first date have to be a single date? Like the idea okay. of if you have really trusted friends or people that you know, like, why don't you say like, hey, a bunch of us are going to go do X. Do you and a couple of your friends or whatever want to join us? So the idea of maybe making that initial first date not be a one-on-one -on -one date, which is a little old school, but there is something to the idea of if this has been an area of struggle for you in the past, right, where you maybe always haven't made the greatest dating choices or haven't had the greatest success, you know, maybe have it be a little bit more of a group experience and have those people that do trust you and know you well be willing to be like, oh, yeah, this guy's like, I think this is an actually a pretty good guy or like, uh, no, you know, you struck out again, sweetheart. So something along those lines is another great, you know, task tool that I, I let people or give yeah. them as an idea. Do you do you offer any suggestions or or maybe just help people brainstorm types of first dates? Like you, you described a great setting for your first date with Chad, and and uh, and I talked mm -hmm, about how great mm -hmm, the first date mm -hmm. of a hike was. Mm -hmm. Does that ever come up in therapy sessions? Oh yeah, and I mean I think it's encouraging people to be honest up front. Like if there's if like they suggest going, like let's just say like they suggest going and hiking, and you hate the outdoors. <laughs> like be honest about right, that. Yeah. Say you know what, I'd love to do something active with you. But I, I really don't love to hike. Okay. I know, right? Craig, Bowling. You, I know. Well, right. The idea that, like, it's and it's okay to not hike. I mean, I know that that's, you know, a lot of people love to do that, and that's great. But, I mean, to me, setting that up front, that I'm going to be a person that can say no, I'm going to be a person that has my own opinion, that I'm a person that that um, is willing to sort of let you know my likes, my dislikes. I mean, I think that's a great way to set a precedent for what a healthy relationship would look like. I want to hang out with you, but I don't want to hike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's say someone, uh, you've got a client who has a crush. What did we just learn from Mara? Your gats being? Yeah. Uh, or, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So so what, what would be some healthy strategies that you would suggest or you would help your client um, try to come come to use to avoid gats being? I thought gats being was a good thing. When or, you put yourself out, like when you're, you want somebody to know that they're crushed, you start to sort of put your feelers out, right? Did she say it was a good thing? No, I don't, I don't think that's such a good thing. Oh, okay. So gats being is bad. Yeah. It's, it's like throw a it's being disgenuine. To to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very okay, authentic. so obviously, technically, even though I went on points, I failed for life right. practicality. Um, yeah. So, see, so I mean, part of this crush, is my like, temperament. What do, you, what do you help people do? Right. Like part of this is my temperament, but I'm a big believer in being honest and upfront and transparent. So if I really, feel, yeah, like if <laughs> I have a <laughs> no shit, <laughs> you didn't recognize that about me. <laughs> if I have a client, and this happens a lot, like I really like this human. I, I, I am. Tell me why. What is it about this human in particular that you like? And I want to know more than they're hot, right? Like, what is it about this person that you're attracted to? And then I really encourage people to say, why don't you go ahead and, and you know, I really enjoy spending time with you. Would you like to 
X. Would you mm-hmm. like to go grab a cup of coffee? Would you like to go bowling with me? I'd love to get to spend more time with you one on one and get to know you better. Not I want to hop in bed with you. It's I want to get to know you better because I think you may be a human that I could really enjoy hanging out with more. So I'm always going to encourage sort of transparency and being brave because I feel like that's a really great way to start a relationship. I I would imagine that you have some clients who talk about dating regrets. And you just mentioned hopping into bed. Like, Mm -hmm. so how how do you help people handle that regrets? I think it's being honest with ourselves and a piece of, we all make mistakes. You know, let's think about Laura. She's got a pretty, pretty interesting story to tell, right, Laura, sure. from, the, from the the beginning of our podcast. We're all going to have things that we wish we could have done differently, that, you know, moments or things that we've done that wish we could take back. But I think it's owning and recognizing that it happened and then it's okay. And then, you know, that open-ended question, tell me what you wish you would have done differently. Tell me how you're going to keep from making those mistakes again. You know, going forward, what was a red flag that maybe popped up that you knew it, but you wanted it to work so bad that you either pretended like it wasn't there or downplayed it? So I think a lot of it, it's like almost like a two-part thing. I got to acknowledge and know that it happened um, so that it doesn't happen again, right? Acceptance is the first step towards change. But then saying, okay, what did I learn? And what can I do differently next time? Do you use motivational interviewing? Some. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would think a good motivational interviewing technique for that is is talking about worst case scenario. So, mm-hmm. so okay, yeah, you did this. Mm-hmm. What's the worst thing that this person could think of you right now? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and get mm-hmm. that on the table to say mm-hmm. that. And so, yeah, could you live with that? Mm-hmm. And and usually mm-hmm. when you get people talk about to mm-hmm. to, to state it out loud, mm-hmm. yeah, it's not so bad, and it's probably not the worst case scenario anyway. Well, and I think it's bringing people back to this recognition that then unless. You live in Utah and are polygamist. You're only going to find one human. So like all the other ones are not going to work. You're going to have people that it doesn't work with and that it falls apart with because you can't have them all. If you are really searching and you are generally a person that's geared towards long-term monogamous relationships, the other ones aren't going to work. You're going to have multiple failures before you meet the right human. So I'm okay with the idea of they can't all work. You know, th- this brings up some a, a thought that that I have about myself and as a father. I've got three sons. My oldest son is 15, and he's not dating yet. And and I think about you know uh, the relationships I had before Jen and um, and heartbreak that went both ways. Like mm-hmm. I dumped people and I got dumped, mm-hmm. and 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 that sucked. Being on both sides of the coin sucks. And part of me doesn't want my sons to ever go through that. But I recognize that they have. You have to feel that. You have to. You have to experience what that is like. And so, so what? What do you think about just life experience of being a yeah. teacher for people? Oh, a hundred percent. And I mean, how can you know what doesn't work? How can you know what you don't want, unless that's what you got at one point in time? How do you know what a really healthy relationship looks like if you haven't had one that's extremely unhealthy? Or to know what it looks like to be with somebody that doesn't respect you if you haven't been in a circumstance where you realize that that person didn't ever listen to you. So, I mean, I'm a big believer. And I think what's interesting is that, and I'd love for you know somebody smarter than me to do research about this, but individuals who have never had heartbreak, that have never had real genuine, you know, sort of that devastating, I didn't see this coming heartbreak, I think struggle later on in their marriage when things get hard. Oh, and yeah. you know, right? Because they've never had to experience things not going well or yeah. sort of falling apart. Whereas if you've had and you know what it means to persevere, then you're capable and able to do that. Right. Okay. So, so you've shared a lot of really good tips here for people. If you were to sort of bring it down to sort of one, one thought, one like the main thing or the soundbite or maybe a mantra for people in the dating world right now. What would it be? What, what, what advice would you share with folks? Know better, do better. Like, know more about yourself. Be willing to ask the hard questions to yourself. Do better out on the dating world. Because everyone has to have a great dating story to tell their grandchildren, the tale of the cat liquor will be Laura's. Surprisingly, that was not the last swipe Laura ever made, and thank God for that. She continued in therapy, not necessarily to get over the cat liquor, but to continue to explore navigating her her emotions and relationships and decision-making. 
Before long, she met someone new, a great guy. Interestingly enough, he was nothing like her. His photo matched his appearance, which was a nice surprise, but she thought there was no chance it would work out. They had different cultural backgrounds, a highly different family makeup, and starkly different political ideologies. But you know what? It worked and continues to work to this day. It works so well that on a beautiful fall day and the not so distant future, their lives will be joined in marriage. Our producer is Brandon Gage. Our sound engineer and composer is Sean Beck. Executive producers are Dave Hagen and Frank Gaskell. Contributors to this episode were Elise Howell and Mara Teal. Our research intern is Maddie Haskin. Nicole Shaver greets us each morning with a smile. You'll find more practical psychology to enhance your life on our website, psychbites.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at psychbites. You can also reach us via email podcast at psychbites.com. Please send us your questions. We love answering them. Also, share your thoughts and suggestions for future show topics. We love suggestions too. Until next time, I'm Craig Pullman. I'm Fights, and this is the Psych Bites Podcast. Podcast.